As lecture time is approaching, we are going to talk about lemon and lemonade. This is the subject of the next panel, investments in the container leasing. So I'm asking please Mr. John Bradley from Vedder Price to come to the podium and moderate the next panel and announce all the panelists. Thank you very much. All right, thank you everyone for uh, attending this uh, next session uh, in which we're going to talk about um, an industry that I've hoped would make one of these panels for years, and that's the container leasing industry. Uh, we're going to, um, I'm going to introduce uh, our four terrific panelists uh, sitting to my left in just a moment, uh, and to tell you uh, what the order of March is going to be here, uh, we're going to um, start with the panelists uh, telling you a little bit about uh, the businesses and the banks that they work for. Uh, we're going to talk about the fundamentals of uh, container leasing, uh, talking about investing and financing container leasing. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about consolidation in the principal industry that container leasing serves, which is the liner shipping industry. Uh, and finally, we're going to talk a little bit about the elephant in the room, which is the collapse of Hanjin shipping. Uh, but first, uh, I wanted to start uh, by, uh, by mentioning that we are celebrating an anniversary this year. Uh, and uh, for those of you uh, who were following such mundane things, uh, it was back in the early 1950s uh, that Malcolm McLean uh, began looking for alternative ways to more, move cargo more safely, efficiently, uh, and effectively. And I'm talking about brake bolt cargo. Uh, and in 1956, he came up with his strategy uh, which was to take a vintage two, T2 uh, tanker called the Ideal X, uh, place a specially fitted deck on the tanker, and he transported 58 trailer boxes from the Port of New York uh, to Texas. And everyone looks at that event as really the birth of containerization. Uh, and it was with the standardization of, of specs for containers beginning in the 1960s uh, that really was the impetus behind the tremendous growth in containerization to today. Um, today, as the industry stands, the industry uh, has volumes exceeding 100 million units of containerized cargo annually. To support this system, there are over 36 million TEUs moving in more than 17 million vessel slots. The container and chassis leasing industry, which is represented here today, um, was developed to support containerized trade by offering equipment and services. Today, the leased fleet worldwide has a replacement value of approximately 49 billion for the 18 million container TEUs and 550,000 chassis in use worldwide. Uh, the, the industry has exploded, as you might of guests. So with me today to talk about this terrific industry and the banks that finance this industry are to my left um, Stephen Ponak, nope. sorry John Burns. Uh, John Burns is not Brian Sunday, although he plays Brian sometimes at investor meetings. Uh, Brian had a conflict and could not be here today. John Burns uh, is the chief financial, ch chief financial officer of the newly created Triton International. Uh, which is a result of the merger this, this past summer between TAL International and Triton Containers. Uh, to John's left is Stephen Ponak. Uh, Stephen is the managing director, is a managing director of the Tuax Group, uh, which uh, are operating lessors of various types of equipment, intermodal equipment, including containers. Um, to Stephen's left is Scott Smith, who's joined us today from California. Uh, Scott is the founder uh, and president of Aquarius Equipment Finance, uh, which is an investor and investment manager uh, in intermodal equipment, particularly containers. Uh, and to Scott's left uh, is Christoph Klaus. Uh, and Chris uh, is a senior VP uh, at DVB Bank, uh, specializing in intermodal equipment uh, and containers. Uh, so I would like, uh, if I could, uh, just ask each of our panelists to uh, briefly introduce themselves, 
the company, or in Chris's case, the bank for which they work, uh, and what their position is uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the container leasing industry. And starting with uh, John Burns to my left, I would ask John to also uh, give us an update on the merger, uh, the perceived benefits of the progress of the merger, uh, and what value propositions this merger has for the various stakeholders of the newly formed Triton International. John? Great. Thanks, John. <clears throat> uh, as John mentioned, I'm the CFO of uh, Triton International. It's a newly formed company. Uh, we closed the transaction on July 12th, just two months ago, and it merged uh, TAL International, a company that had been in the container business for over 50 years uh, and had been public on the New York Ex Stock Exchange since 2004. We merged together with a private company by the name of Triton Container, uh, which had been around for over 30 years. You know, in our mind, bringing together two of the best players in the industry. You know, the combination, you know, the operations are up and running well. Uh, we expect the merger is going to result in significant operational and financial advantages, you know, for all of our stakeholders. Uh, we believe that Triton and TAL create a clear market leader. After the merger, we're the number one container lessor in the business with over 25% market share and 5 million TEUs. The, the two businesses were very complementary. You know, the Triton International, together, we have a leading position in all the major uh, container types, and we have great global coverage, you know, both operationally and marketing, and relationships with the key shipping lines at all levels throughout their organization. So, you know, this really, from our perspective, is a powerhouse organization, uh, and you know, we think, again, provides great uh, advantages to all our stakeholders. You know, from the standpoint of the, you know, the integration, it's going well. Obviously, it's a big undertaking. We've gone through the first round of, of staff transitions in our sales and operating teams. You know, have uh, been merged together. <clears throat> we have systems and back office things that will take a little bit, probably take us into the first quarter of next year. Overall, you know, we've, we've told the, the market that we expect and, and continue to expect over $40 million of combined SG&A savings from this merger. Um, and again, you know, together with the operating capabilities really provides, you know, a, a great and a, and a powerful uh, company. Thank you, John. Stephen, um, you're up next. And Stephen, uh, when you uh, give your comments, uh, I know that um, the 2X Group uh, is one of the leading managers of intermodal equipment and containers. Could you also talk about that a little bit? Uh, thanks, John. Yeah, absolutely. So to start with, the 2X um, has uh, been in existence for almost 170 years. It's a French-based company that started out and was, for most of its uh, history, basically a barge transportation business. Over the last 30 years, the company has transitioned to the operating leasing business with four main asset classes. Uh, the number one being the container leasing business with a fleet of about uh, 600,000 TU. Uh, the second being the, um, uh, I'll focus on the transport intermodal space, the um, rail freight uh, uh, leasing business with a fleet of about 10,000 uh, rail cars almost exclusively in Europe today. And then we have uh, a barge leasing business, where, which uh, has an overall fleet of about 150 barges spread through um, South America, North America, and of course in Europe. Um, as we have in total, uh, and then the, sorry, the fourth activity, which is the modular building, which isn't uh, a transport equipment or modular building in the United States known as the uh, trailer business. That's uh, almost exclusively European as well. And that's a business um, that has, uh, we have in our fleet uh, around 48,000 uh, units. Uh, as well as owning and managing equipment for our own balance sheet, as John mentioned, we also uh, manage equipment for uh, third-party investors. Today we have an uh, overall asset value of about $2 billion and 60% of that is actually owned by third-party investors. Those third-party investors are a, a very group uh, from pockets of family offices to institutional investors here in the United States and, and in Europe 
uh, to some uh, Japanese trading companies, uh, and uh, it's historically an activity that the group has uh, focused on for over 20 years. Um, what's uh, new for the group is we're in the process of uh, closing on our first Luxembourg fund, an open-ended fund uh, with two compartments, one in euros and one in dollars. Uh, we'll close on the euro portion with uh, the acquisition of a 56 million euro portfolio of European rail cars and uh, start the fundraising for the uh, US dollar portion, which will be mainly uh, focused on container assets. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Stephen, uh, to Stephen's left uh, is Scott Smith. Uh, and when I think of Scott Smith, and Stephen was talking about um, uh, container management and investment managers, when I think of investment managers, the first person I always think of is Scott. Uh, and, you know, in my own mind, is kind of the ubiquitous Scott Smith because uh, on deals that I've worked on um, and workouts that I've been on over the years, uh, somebody always said, well, Scott did that, or this is how Scott would do that. Uh, and I would say, well, who's Scott? Uh, this is Scott. Um, so, Scott, uh, could you tell us a little bit about Aquarius? Sure. Thanks, John, for those kind words. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I started Aquarius Equipment Finance. Yeah, we'll close. I started Aquarius Equipment Finance 20 years ago, and the approach to the industry we took was similar to what a real estate investment firm would do. We source uh, the equity and debt, we uh, structure the investment, uh, we make the investment in operating leasing managers such as Tuox and, and others, and manage the investment throughout its term. And just like a real estate investment firm, we view the uh, uh, operating lessors kind of as property managers, if you will, because that they're in charge of running the containers on a day-to-day -day basis, pay the operating costs, repair the containers, lease them, release them, sell them at the end. So that's kind of the approach to the industry we took. We've invested over 1.1 billion over the last 20 years across 93 transactions. Um, and currently we see a, a tremendous counter-cyclical opportunity in the market with container prices at a 14-year low. When we look back 14 years ago, uh, the deals we've done in the you know, 2000 to 2004 timeframe, those, deal, those deals are completed now and have clicked in at an unleveraged return of 12%. We add some leverage to that that gets you to the, the high teens. And we see similar opportunities right now in the marketplace, so we're very excited about this uh, current situation. Thanks, Scott. Uh, to Scott's left uh, is Christoph Klaus of DBB Bank. Now, of course, when I think of DBB, I always think of uh, two things. I think, you know, this is the leading shipping bank, one of the leading shipping banks in the world. I also think of their hallucinogenic logo that you see up there. <laughs> but I. I, I never really thought of DBB as a, as a leader uh, in intermodal finance and container finance, but Chris is here to tell us about that. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, DBB, in, in simple facts, we're, we're a German bank, we're listed in Frankfurt, and we're majority owned by the Z Bank, which is um, the third largest banking group in Germany with 500 billion in assets. Um, but what makes DVB special and unique, I think, is our business model, which solely focuses on transportation finance. So we're really not doing anything else than providing financing to the aviation and land transport offshore and, and, and shipping segments. So and with shipping itself, it accounts for roughly 50% of our book. And, and the container industry of that, and that's both the vessel and the, 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 the box side, are integral parts of, of, of our shipping division. Um, I think as a bank, what makes us stand apart is, is, is really the asset and industry expertise. It really runs throughout the, the bank. It's from top to bottom, from bottom to up. And, and we are, we're supported by dedicated research and technical teams, which give their input in every single deal we do. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty unique uh, in, in, in the space. The, the other point I think is, is even more important in today's market is, is that we are, given how focused we are on the industry, is that we are there um, and available to lend throughout cycles. Um, I, I think that accounts for, for whether it's an existing client or whether it's a new client, and also whether it's a corporate client or whether it's a non-recourse deal. So given our asset expertise, we're not shying away from that either. 
So in a, in a market where you're seeing banks retract from the industry and the capital markets not really being available to shipping, I think it's, it's of unmeasurable value for, for our clients to have a bank that is, that is out there all the time. In terms of the intermodal business specifically, I think we have always been and are one of the core lenders into that industry. Um, I think at Speak we had exposure well north of $1 billion um, just to the container uh, industry. Um, we like this space. Um, it's, it's been historically very good for the bank and we'll hope to do more business going, going forward in the industry despite where we are today. Thank you, Chris. You know, to me, uh, as an outsider to the business, I mean, I, I, I can't think of a more simple product. Um, you have a box, uh, and the box uh, has a useful life, uh, and these folks uh, uh, manage that box through its useful life, from production through eventual resale. Uh, Stephen, could you just take us through, I mean, I, what I'd like to know is, we heard an earlier panel today talking about, you know, for a building a ship, there's a two to four year order period. Uh, it's obviously much less than that for boxes. I want to know how do uh, lessors like yourselves and John to your right, um, how, how do you determine how many boxes? Do you order boxes on spec? Do you link them up with contracts? Uh, and what is the pricing like right now? Why don't we start first with, uh, you know, what is it? What drives the ordering of boxes? Is it, is it GDP? Is it import exports? How do you, how do you de determine that? Well, you know, I think uh, from our standpoint, uh, there's uh, two or three main drivers that we see in the uh, container leasing business. Obviously, uh, worldwide trade growth is probably the most important uh, one, with a multiplier on container growth of anywhere from you know one to one and a half. What we're seeing currently. Um, other important drivers, and John, I'm sure you'll weigh in on <laughs> your own view of, uh, of uh, those drivers, but uh, uh, obviously uh, what's going on in steel and uh, where uh, can, steel is the main driver of container prices, of course, and what's happening on the container price will also be an important factor on, on driving um, uh, demand, uh, at least from our shipping, uh, our clients. Uh, the um, where you know there's in a low environment cycle there's an arbitrage uh, from older containers to younger containers uh, which can be uh, quite substantial um, another factor that uh, clearly comes into play is also um, the uh, 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 we'll look at what the stock of available units are on the ground and uh, make a decision on uh, whether or not we want to speculate based on that. Uh, we've seen that uh, uh, be pretty substantial uh, towards the end of last year. It's uh, come down since then, uh, and uh, we see it continuing to come down as utilization is improving across the industry as a whole, and uh, both through sales, but also the fact that uh, the cycle, as John mentioned, and I'm sure John, uh, Burns, you can add to it, but the cycle is very short between when we order equipment and when we get delivery. And that helps us versus the shipping industry. I, th I think there's a lot of shipping guys out here who, as John Bradley mentioned, have to order two to three years in advance. We don't have to deal with that because our delay is anywhere from 30 to 60 days. I think that's a great point. I think, you know, the way we think about it is the business proposition that we provide to our shipping line customers is having immediately available containers on the ground in the key port locations, export port locations typically for dry containers, that would be Asia. Um, and we, we balance those, you know, if, if demand is strong and we lease out containers, we increase the level of that off, uh, off higher uncommitted shelf of inventory. In, in, in some respects, we've used the analogy in the past almost like a fast food restaurant. So when, you, when it's getting close to noon, the fast food restaurant is going to put all their different products up on the shelf and in preparation for the demand. As you get into the later afternoon, the amount of units that they're going to have on the shelf is going to recede. So it's somewhat similar. So we, instead of worrying about lunchtime, we're worried about, you know, what is GDP? What is the, the peak season demand look like from our customers? And as Stephen mentioned, 
you know, the, again, that value that we're providing to the customer is you know, they could buy a container. If they knew exactly what ports and how many units they needed in every single port, they could either put their own in there uh, and available, or they could buy containers in those locations, but they don't uh, in enough time. So often, you know, they, they will buy 50% of their containers and at least 50% of their containers. Um, and the least ones are really for that immediate supply that they can't, don't have time, you know, over the next two or three weeks, they need the units uh, now. So that's really the proposition we provide to our shipping line customers. Thanks, John. Uh, hey, Scott, uh, take us through the uh, management of a container through its uh, natural life cycle, from the time it's delivered, through midlife, through end of life. Sure. If you move this as close as you can. Okay. So we view the container really as an asset that lasts 30 to 50 years, and after that, long life still has a salvage value, the steel itself. A 20-foot container has about 1.8 tons worth of steel. So you have an asset that produces for 30 to 50 years and you still have a salvage value at the end. It's a pretty nice deal. Uh, what happens initially, the, the, the container leaves with cargo, uh, China, where most of the containers are being produced, usually on a five-year lease, but sometimes as long as an eight-year operating lease. But let's take the, the usual case of five years. What then happens after the five years, usually unless the market conditions are really adverse, the shipping line, and as long as the lessor has offered a competitive lease rate, will extend another three years, because it's actually expensive to bring containers back for the shipping line. There are handling and repair costs, and the repair um, um, standard is much higher for the lessors than for the shipping lines. So it's actually you know, expensive for them to bring the box back. So what do they do? They keep it unless they really, really don't need it. So usually they need it, they extend for another three years, and after that they usually extend for another two years. So that gets you usually through the first 10 years of a container's life on lease. Steady cash flow is very predictable. Um, after that, some shipping lines um, prefer offering these containers because they start looking a little bit um, scratched or, or so the paint is not as, as pretty as it used to be, but structurally and functionally, they're very, very much still intact. And in fact, some shipping lines, MSC, for example, will keep these boxes 15 to 20 years, which is fantastic. But some shipping lines, as I said, men, uh, tend to offer after 10 years' time. What happens then, these containers come back and go traditionally more into a shorter master lease type environment where they get usually leased out for anywhere from six months to two years. And uh, eventually, after when they come back after 12, 13 years, they start getting sold off into the secondary markets. The secondary market is, is fragmented globally, but it's huge. Uh, annually, 1.5 to 2 million TUs get sold into the secondary market. And you see them on every construction site. You see uh, uh, mobile storage uh, parks. Uh, there, are, there are some public companies in the US that buy these containers from the lessors and shipping lines and then use them literally for another 20 to 30 years as domestic storage units, convert them to modular offices, modular uh, um, classrooms, et cetera, et cetera. So really you have this tremendous long life, but they're getting phased out of the shipping and leasing life usually after 10 to 15 years. But because there's this remaining life after that, that is keeping the resale values extremely high. And Traditionally, when a container gets sold after 10 to 15 years into the secondary markets, they usually yield 45 to 55% of the new container price at that point in time. And that's very important that, to understand the, the back end economics of these containers because when a secondary market buyer buys a container, he can say, I can buy a used container for $600 or a new container for, let's say, $1,200. But if that ratio gets skewed too far either way, then you know, it'll dictate which way the, the buyer in the secondary market will go. And as mentioned, there they last another 20 to 30 years, and, and at the end of that, you have a scrap value. It's a fantastic asset. Thanks, Scott. Um, I want to ask Chris, um, uh, and, and this is a great question really for, for, uh, for a banker at DVB, because they, they finance just about every transportation asset class imaginable. Uh, but unlike uh, aircraft and ships, uh, where you take back a mortgage or, uh, and you uh, 
uh, you can file the mortgage or under Cape Town, you can register your mortgage and your security interests. Um, uh, containers are a completely different cat. And I'm just wondering from a banker's standpoint, in a traditional lending facility, how does, the ban how does a banker get comfortable um, with the risk associated with financing containers that go to every part of the world and in parts that don't have jurisdictions that we necessarily respect ownership or lease, leasing, et cetera? Chris? Um, good question. Um, <laughs> now, first of all, the equivalent to, to, to the mortgage is the UCC filings here in the Americas, where you, which you get for the boxes. But in the, the most important aspects and as, as comfort for a bank is, is obviously who is, who is your counterparty, who is your manager, and, and what are their capabilities in, in, in case something goes wrong, what's their network. Um, the beauty in the, in the box industry, and we'll probably see that already here on the, in the Hanjin case, is that the box actually finds you. You don't have to go out and, and, and find the box because um, there are cargo interests. The boxes are on the ships, and, and the value of what is in the boxes is, is most of the time worth more than the box itself. So the shipper has an incremental um, interest in, in making sure he gets that box. So as we are obviously one step removed, but you, you get the, the position list from, from the liners, and then you kind of, together probably with the shippers, make, make sure that the, the boxes get off the ship, and then ideally are, are re-delivered into, into your own depots. Um, and then you have to, to look how you, if, what condition the box is. Uh, if the box has come back into, into, into depots that are controlled by Hanjin, uh, it, it's probably going to be more difficult to, to get the box out. But in terms of recovery experience, I, I think the ex probably my, my colleagues can, can speak too much better to that, um, but I think around 90%, 80-90% of the boxes generally come back within a time frame of, of, of 6, maybe 12 months. Um, there are always some, some stragglers or, or some that, that got lost along the way or that have to be sold somewhere, but in general, the, the big, big, big majority of the boxes comes back. And if you, if you from a lending perspective, uh, see what kind of uh, enhancement you work, uh, that percentage is, is, is generally covered. And it obviously comes down, if, do you have a non-recourse pool or do you have a recourse to one of the big lessors? Um, and that's generally how you, how you look at it. Thanks, Chris. Um, you know, we've come through a period uh, in this industry uh, where we've seen a, a bit of softening, I think that would be a correct expression, uh, in leasing rates, um, particularly, as, particularly as boxes are coming off those initial uh, five to six year uh, leases uh, that Scott was talking about, uh, and we have uh, we've seen uh, a softening of some of the utilization rates, which were as high as the high 90s in recent years. Um, so my question to my friend John here, and also uh, to Stephen, is um, what has been the trend in utilization uh, and leasing rates for those five those bo new boxes coming off off their fir first five to six year lease, and what do you see in the future, John? You know, there's definitely, to your point, there's been uh, some ebbs and flows in this industry forever as far as um, utilization goes. And it gets back to some of the discussions we were having earlier about production. And it's a very short order cycle. So what we've seen over the years is that as soon as excess supply builds up in the industry, that the people that order those containers, which are the shipping lines and the lease codes, stop ordering. And relatively quickly, because of the sale of the units out the back end, which run, you know, 3 4 5% a year, that the industry, uh, the, the supply and demand catches up pretty quickly. We, we saw it uh, in, very significantly in the 2009 crisis. Basically, everybody stopped ordering. The, uh, the container factories were closed for 15 to 18 months. Um, and during that period of time, the disposals of uh, the five to seven percent of the containers aged out of uh, aged out of the fleet and all of a sudden you're back in in fact in a in a shortage position when the market started to recover uh, we saw a similar though less dramatic uh, impact in 2015 where uh, trade slowed fairly dramatically 
uh, relative to expectations. 14 was a strong year, uh, low single digits, uh, but relatively strong for the container lessors. Uh, people built containers at the end of 14 going into 15 with the expectation of you know, 4 to 5 to 6 percent growth. We end up at probably 1 to 0 percent growth, so there was too many containers. Probably in the middle of 2015, everybody stopped ordering. Uh, the lessors and the shipping lines stopped ordering new containers, and by the time you get into 2016, uh, you already saw the tightening of supply, and, and that's what we're seeing today is, you know, supply is now basically back in balance. Um, the See, the, let me just stop you there, John. You can't convince me of that, because every time I drive by Newark Airport, I see tens of thousands of empty containers sitting there, and I think, is there an overcapacity? Is supply uh, outstripping demand, or is this just it's just this an indication of a trade imbalance where boxes are in the wrong place at the wrong time? Stephen, why don't you take that? Uh, well, you know, again, there's uh, 36 million containers in circulation, uh, about 18 million that you cited uh, correctly, which is owned by the, the lessors. So, you know, seeing tens of thousands, even though it's a lot in the port in New Jersey doesn't necessarily reflect what's going on globally in, in terms of where uh, um, demand is. A and I think you rightly said that it uh, relates to um, somewhat of an imbalance, which most of the traffic you know, coming to the United States, not enough of it uh, going back to Asia, which creates uh, uh, an oversupply here in the United States, although the United States, at least from two axis standpoint, remains the best market uh, worldwide for secondhand sales. So, it, it, you know, older containers uh, redelivered to the United States is something that we try and do as we uh, come to the end of the life cycle of a container. Scott, how does um, how does a good manager um, manage its way through? these trade imbalance problems because you have got, I mean, it seems like, you know, you could one way containers for the rest of your life to the United States, uh, but then you got to somehow get them back. Sure. Um, how does that process get managed? Yeah. Uh, the industry kind of changed over the last 10 years. The industry used to be uh, predominantly short term master lease driven, and now it's predominantly long term lease driven for exactly those reasons. Uh, so a shipping line doesn't just pick up the container in China and drops it off at Newark 30 days later. That would be a disaster. So therefore, you, you know, these lease terms are usually at a minimum five years long. And then you protect yourself, or the lessor protects themselves by having off-hire restrictions by port location. And a port like uh, Newark, which is a terrible location for uh, to have a container box it's it's almost impossible to lease them out of there and storage rates are extraordinarily expensive so that's the last place you want to have a container so first of all they have a long lease period where they protect it where the shipping line cannot off hire and then the off hire conditions in the lease usually dictate that it can only off hire so many per month in a place like newark and often even with off hire uh, uh, fees so they have to contribute to the lessor's cost of moving that container empty back to a leasable location such as China. Then you see that the, the, the really where, where a lessor stands out then is actually trying to find opportunities through freight, freight forwarders to move the container with cargo. It's not easy to do, it still costs money, but it's a lot cheaper than moving the, the container empty to China. And that's where you see big differences in terms of lessor's ability to do that. And the good ones have, have developed those relationships, and I'm really good at it. Chris, uh, question for you. Um, where, is, where is the leverage coming from these days? I, you know, if, I guess the first question is, is leverage available in this industry right now? I know in the recent past, of course, our friend John here was a, a large consumer of um, ABS securitizations. Uh, DVB is a big player in that market. What do you see currently and going forward in terms of the ABS securitization market for containers? I think generally the, the, the simple answer to your question is, is, is financing available leverage, whether well, it's bank debt or ABS, I think the simple answer is yes. Um, but we're probably a little bit beyond the peak. Um, 
ever since 2011, I think, um, when the ABS markets came back, there was an abundance of, of cheap liquidity, um, both on the bank side and, and from, the, from, the, from the ABS side, um, at good rates. And, and the lessors rightly took advantage of that and, and um, took that money. Um, that was mainly on the back of very good performance, um, cash flow performance uh, on higher performance utilizations, which attracted a lot of uh, new banks, some, some more regional banks that looked more at it from a, from a corporate perspective, but also it brought in a lot of, of new ABS investors. So the books of, of, of the lessors, in terms of investor universe, which got broader and broader. Um, over the last one and a half years, I think, um, when the market softened and there's a bigger divide now between their book values and, and, and fair market value, which is basically the new build price um, and, and, and per diems, um, people have taken a little bit of a step back. So we'll probably see some of the, the more corporate ba of banks, um, of corporate focused banks, maybe drop out. Um, uh, I don't know if there are going to be much more coming back in, um, but nonetheless, given the, the capex um, that the, the lessors especially have spent over the last year, year and a half, which hasn't been much in historic terms, I think the financing and the ability to roll over financings at, compared to shipping, very, very good terms still persist, so they have that ability. On, on the ABS side, I think everyone is also looking at you know, what's happening to the market the, the, and, and, and how are we working through the Hanjin situation now. So everyone's looking at the pool they have invested in, what's the exposure to Hanjin in the in individual pools, and, and what's going to happen now. Are some of the vessels or some of the assets taken out? Are additional assets going to be pledged? So how, how do you keep the, the cash flow cover and the asset cover? Um, but we have, to date, only had one issuance uh, by one lessor. Um, it's been a bit wider uh, than, than in the past, but, but I think if you, if you go out now today, I think you will probably still have a four handle, maybe a five handle, depending on the pool. But are the markets still open for the, for the big guys? Yes, but there could be a bigger kind of, everything at the moment is about credit and counterparty risk. And, and there could become a bigger divide between kind of the individual players and player sizes. From an asset perspective, you look at it kind of in the, in the digital pools as a, as a bank. What are, what are the cash flow characteristics? What are the type of assets in there and the age? And you make your decision. Chris, thanks. Um, I could spend hours with these guys, uh, but Nicholas is feverishly giving me the high sign, so we've got to stop. I've got a million questions for them, uh, and, um, and you may as well. If, uh, you may too, and if you catch them in the hall, I mean, questions I have for them, which will go unanswered at this point, um, are, you know, what we are seeing tremendous, we're seeing consolidation in the liner shipping industry. We're seeing uh, realignments of shipping uh, uh, VSAs and uh, various alliances. The 2M may add Hyundai. Uh, the Ocean Alliance may be forming. We've seen uh, Hopag Lloyd and Hamburg Sud acquire South American. I'm, I'm curious as to know, how, those, how the rationalization of their customers is affecting their business. I'm curious as to what, what I assume is going to be a massive recovery effort among all container lessors out of the Hanjin collapse, uh, what that is going to do uh, to lease rates and to uh, pricing going forward. But unfortunately, we don't have time uh, to answer any of those questions. So I want to thank uh, very, very much uh, Chris and Scott and Stephen and John for making their time available today. And thank you all for attending and paying attention. Thank you. Question.